Hey friends, welcome to the All Means All podcast. Pastor Dwayne here at Cathedral of the Rockies. Today, we have a special treat for you for one of my friends, Pastor Steve Tollison, Reverend Dr. Steve Tollison, Pastor Emeritus of Cathedral of the Rockies, will be preaching and sharing a message with us. Steve was our pastor here for 17 years and led us to build the Emmaus Center. He also was one of the founding pastors at the Amity Campus years before. And so Steve, we love Steve when he comes to preach. He always has a great message for us and he's part of our, our journey. So welcome, Steve, we're glad you're here today. Well, good morning, church. I wanted to kind of give a shout out to Pastor Dwayne. When I, I served here for as 17 years as the senior pastor, and when I retired 12, <laughs> and when I retired 12 years ago, Pastor Dwayne gave me the best gift I could have ever asked. Tradition has in our denomination that once you retire and leave the church, you are not to go set foot back in that church to, so you don't intimidate the, the new pastor. Uh, but T Pastor Dwayne was not intimidated by me, and he invited me to come back because after eight years at Amity and 17 here, I had a lot of friends, so it was great to be back to reconnect. And then he gave me that wonderful title, Pastor Emeritus. And some people say, what does that mean? Well, it means that I do for free what I used to get paid for. <laughs> but, it's, but, it's, but it's a nice title. It's a nice title. So before I preach, let us bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Guide me as I seek to preach. Guide each of us as we seek to listen. That somehow, some way, through the human word, your divine word may be proclaimed and heard for your greater glory. This we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. As you've heard, today is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, it's often called the birthday of the church. It was 50 days earlier that Jesus had been raised from the grave. And during those past 50 days, the disciples had kind of stayed together. They hadn't ventured out in public. They, hadn't, they were kind of fearful. I mean, they didn't know what the people, the authorities would do. I mean, they crucified Jesus. If I come out as a follower of Jesus, they might crucify me, crucify me as well. So they, they stayed to themselves. And Jesus appeared to them periodically, and they shared that with the community. But on Pentecost Sunday, everything changed. This is how the writer of the book of Acts puts it. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound from heaven, like the howling of a fierce wind, filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amused, amazed and saying, Look, aren't all the people who are speaking Galileans, every one of them? How can each of us hear them speaking in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, as well as residents from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phyriga and Pamphylia, and Egypt and regions from Libya bordering on Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our own language. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them saying, they're full of new wine. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Yes, it came like a mighty wind. And those disciples who were sitting in fear in that room were touched and filled with the Holy Spirit. And they found the courage to go out, out into public and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Sharing that Jesus had been crucified, but he has been raised from the dead. Yes, 
And they saw God's movement at that time. But isn't it interesting, whenever you see somebody talking about God doing this or God doing that, there's other people who see the same thing but understand it differently. As some there saw God moving at that time at Pentecost, there were others who, watching the exact same thing, said, you know, these guys are just drunk. They've just had too much wine. But those who saw God at that moment saw a God who was breaking down barriers. Because often language is a barrier between communicating with people, but they're able to hear in their own native languages these, these peasant Palestinians speaking that way. They saw a God who, who empowered people to overcome their fear. It was a powerful message. But isn't that what Jesus did? Didn't, didn't he break down a lot of barriers in his ministry? I, I mean... You think about it, in the first century, leprosy was a dreaded disease. In fact, the book of Leviticus tells you that if you're a leper, you have to wear torn clothes. That way, people from a distance can see somebody with torn clothes, and, and they will, uh, they, they'll stay away from you. On top of that, you don't comb your hair. It's supposed to be disheveled. That helps you spot a leper farther away, too. And if you start to come closer to that leper, the leper is commanded to cover the lower part of his face and shout out, unclean, unclean. Doesn't even want their breath to touch you. And the, and the Gospel of Matthew tells this wonderful story of a man who was a leper, but he had the courage to finally come and, and kneel before Jesus and said, if you are willing, you can heal me. And Jesus did a most loving gesture. He reached out his hand and touched that leper. Do you realize how long that leper had never felt the touch of another human being? People were so fearful for him, he reached out and touched the leper and said, I so do well. And he was healed. When there's a story of, of Jesus going to the home of Simon the leper to eat, in biblical days, you only eat with your friends. You do not eat with your enemies. And he went to the home of a leper. And everything in that house would be unclean. But he breaks down that barriers. And I mean, he ate with tax collectors and sinners. I, I, scripture doesn't tell us what sins they had committed, but everybody in town would know they're undesirable. They would know what sin they committed, and he ate with them. I, I love the story of the woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. For 12 years, no one had come near her. She was isolated. Anything she touched and you touched, you're unclean. For 12 years, she was isolated, and she was so fearful that she sneaks up behind Jesus and kneels and touches the hem of his garment. And Jesus feels the power leaving him. And he said, who touched me? And the disciples said, well, everybody's touching you. And then he turns around and sees her. And she said, your faith has made you well. And she was healed. She was restored. The barriers that had kept her from other people had been broken down. And they were now at one. She could go and associate with people, with their family, her life was changed. And when Pentecost came and the church began, they tried to follow what Jesus did. There's a story told in the... In the I just, there's just, wait a minute, I just blanked out. Okay, yeah. And it's Jesus' ministry, one of Jesus, what Jesus did. Well, the next screen is on the screen back, and I realize I'm about ready to pass over it. So... Here's what Jesus tried to do. Jesus tried to convey God's absolute love for every single human being. When you read the Gospels about Jesus, that's what he did. He tried to convey God's absolute love for every single human being. That's a powerful message. And when Pentecost came and the church began to be formed and began to go out, they tried to follow the example of Jesus. And one great example is Philip. Uh, Philip uh, felt the nudging of that Pentecost spirit to, to go and take a walk down the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's, it's a desert road. The spirit didn't tell him why or what's going to happen. He has no idea. Just that nudging of the spirit to get on that road. And as he's walking down the road, 
An Ethiopian eunuch comes by, sitting in his chariot. He, he's a man of prestige, and he's, he's reading from the prophet Isaiah. Now, the nudging of the Spirit, the nudging of the Spirit encourages Philip to get into that. But wait a minute. He, here's what Scripture says about a, a eunuch. No eunuch is to enter the congregation of God. There's no if, ands, or buts about that. No eunuch is welcome. No eunuch. So do you follow scripture? But wait a minute. He was reading from the prophet Isaiah, and the prophet Isaiah hints that, that eunuchs may be welcome. So you have two conflicting passages of scripture. So what does Philip do? Which passage of scripture do you follow? And with the prompting of the Spirit, he gets in the chariot and follows the prophet Isaiah and begins to share the good news of Jesus Christ. But to me, that, that is uh, what takes place throughout church history. We have a conflict. What are we supposed to do? If you look at Scripture, sometimes you'll find passages that say one thing and other passages of Scripture say exactly the opposite. What are you called to do? I mean, look at the issue of slavery. Slavery had been a part of human culture from probably time beginning. And it was not until the 19th century that the Christian faith began to look at slavery, whether this is something God desires or not. And so it became a pretty strong conflict within the church. It was in 19, 1838 that the Presbyterians brought it to a vote, and obviously it split the Presbyterians over the issue. It was a couple years later that the two largest Protestant denominations, the Methodists and the, and the, and the Baptists, decided on the issue. It was in 1845 that the Methodists took a vote. And 60% of the Methodist church said slavery was an abomination in the eyes of God. 40% pointed out there are more passages of Scripture that affirm slavery than oppose slavery. So we're going to go with the majority of passages in Scripture. And so now the church split. It was not until 1939, that, that long passed, before the church rejoined. Because now, after all those years, there was no question everybody agreed that slavery was wrong. But isn't that kind of the pattern of church conflicts? We read the same Bible, we worship the same Lord, and sometimes come up with different denominations because we disagree with somebody. But that same spirit was moving, and there were some, there were some women who began to feel like, I, I feel God calling me to be a preacher. Well, so often in the Christian faith, what takes place is that we go to Scripture to end discussion. Scripture says this, that's it, no ifs, ands, or buts. The Jewish faith, they go to Scripture to begin discussion. Do you hear the difference? So when women are beginning to say that I feel God calling me to be a preacher, some of the clergy just went right to 1 Corinthians. And this is what 1 Corinthians said. Like in all the churches of God's people, the women should be quiet during the meeting. They are not allowed to talk. Instead, they need to get under control. Ladies, listen to this. Get under control just as the law says. If they want to learn something, they should ask their husbands at home. <laughs> well, that's what that says. I just <laughs> but see, now the interesting thing is there were other Christians who say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, look at the Gospels. All four Gospels the risen Christ appears to women first. And what do those women do? They go to the other disciples and they preach the good news. They announce the good news that Jesus Christ is risen. And some would say, I think those were the first Christian preachers were women. We need to return to that. And so finally, it was in May 4th, 3rd, May 4th, that women are granted full clergy rights in the United Methodist Church. 
But think about it. You're dealing with different, an issue, and you find opposite passages of Scripture as you struggle with that. What is God's desire? And, and today we're dealing with the issue of homosexuality. We know that, so it split the Methodist church. And, 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 and it's, I don't know how long we have been arguing and debating on that issue for, for, for most of my ministry. I, I, I should have checked with Dwayne. How, how long ago before this church put up the sign that said, all means all? That's a bold statement in our community in Boise. All means all. That means everyone is welcome. But you know, this church has a history of making bold statements. When I was appointed a senior pastor here in 1995, one of the first clergy to welcome me was Dr. Herb Richards. Uh, Herb was the pastor who built the cathedral. And in our subsequent uh, conversations, he shared with me how they laid the cornerstone for the cathedral. And this is what it is. A Roman Catholic gave the stone, an LDS laid the stone, an Episcopalian gave the gavel to two members of the church's board of trustees, Mr. Leonard and Mr. Ash, and, a div- and a, both the devout United Methodists, and a black pastor offered the prayer. Prejudice, where is thy power? Cruelty, where is thy sting? Death itself will be defeated by the advancing power of you and me together. I mean, look how many barriers Herb sought to break down. That tension between different denominations and color barriers. See, I don't know, this was took place in 1960, and I don't know uh, the culture in 1960 in Boise. I do know what it was like in Nampa in 1960. I was a ninth grader at Central Junior High. There was some tension between denominations and positions of faith, but, but one thing we were all clear, at least in my circles, Dr. Martin Luther King was a communist, a dang commie, troublemaker, making problems, there's no need for that. Things are just fine the way they are. That, that was our culture. And what Herb did to me was extremely profound. But now we, we look at the United Methodist Church and as we struggle with the issue of, of homosexuality. It was in May 4th. This is what the General Conference did. The General Conference of the United Methodist Church overwhelmingly supports the end of anti-LGBTQ plus uh, ch- church on minist- uh, ministry for, for people in the ministry. That was a powerful statement to make. And I agree with that 100%. But the problem is 25% of our com- community, our churches, left the denomination over that issue. Now, you think about it, how can it be we're using the same Bible, we're worshiping the same Lord Jesus Christ, and how can we come up with two different opposite positions? I mean, I don't know. All I can share you is my own journey of faith, my own journey of faith. Uh, When I first began to take my faith seriously, I read the Bible literally. And I have to say, I would probably have left with the 25%. But as I began to study Scripture more, I I realized what I was doing. I was just cherry-picking passages that agreed with my position. I wasn't allowing God to speak through Scripture. I was speaking into Scripture what I wanted to hear. And, 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 so, and what is, as I wrestled with it, and as I grew in my faith, and I grew in my understanding of Scripture and studied it, because to me, Scripture is kind of the basis of my faith. It guided me. I see God speaking through Scripture, and all of a sudden, I began to find passages that were troubling. I found in the book of Exodus, a father can sell his daughter into slavery if he chooses. Or in the book of Deuteronomy, you can force a woman to marry her rapist. <laughs> 
Or also in the book of Deuteronomy, if I have a stubborn and rebellious son, uh, I can have him stoned to death. And Leviticus tells me I can't eat pork and I can't eat shrimp. And all of a sudden I realize I'm just picking passages that agree with me and other passages I'm ignoring. And I think what we're called to do with Scripture as we wrestle with these different difficult issues is to wrestle with scripture to try to hear all the passages of scripture to try to discern what God is speaking to us today I mean I think that's how scripture wants to be read here's a good example here's a good good example Uh, how are you supposed to deal with Bible calls a fool well if you want to turn to Proverbs this is exactly what it says to deal with it Do not answer fools according to their folly, or you will be a fool yourself. No ambiguity in that statement, except if you read the very next verse. Answer fools according to their folly, or they will be wise in their own eyes. That's diametrically opposed, both in Scripture right side by side. See, I think what Scripture wants you to do There's a lot of extenuating circumstances in those encounters. Allow the Spirit of God to guide you. Who is the fool? What's your relationship with him or her? Uh, What's the relationship with the community? How deep is your community? There's so many other issues to allow the Spirit of God to guide you. And I think that's what Scripture calls us to do on some of these uh, touchy, touchy issues. And as we look at the whole story, Part of our journey is trying to discern what is God's will for us. See, I find it very troubling now that when I have a lot of brothers and sisters of the faith who we used to be closer, but now over the issue of of gay rights, we're not as close. There's tension there. And what are we as Christians called to do? Jesus in the Gospel of John said, you're to love one another. So, so, by, so everyone will know that you are my followers when you love one another. But it was uh, uh, Bias, Jared Bias, who has this interesting comment, which is so true. And he said this, true love is about how we treat people who disagree with us. True love is about how we treat people who disagree with us how hard it is to show love when people we disagree with on very important issues. And there's no easy solution. But the good news today is Pentecost Sunday. Just as the Spirit came at that first church, so too the Spirit is moving in our midst. And as the Spirit gave them the power to go out and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, so too the same Spirit can guide us and help us as we seek to love those who disagree with us. And the same Spirit will also guide us as we struggle to discern what is God's will in these controversial issues. And to trust in God that if we are on the right path, God will affirm us. If we've made the wrong choice, God will guide us back. That's why we celebrate Pentecost as the birthday of the church. So let us pray. Most loving and gracious God, thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for others in our community of faith who disagree with us. Help us to learn to listen to one another, to care for one another, to respect one another, to know they were all seeking to be faithful. And help us always come out on that which is the most loving and caring aspect of it all help us to trust in you that you will never leave us even if we make the wrong choice but you are always with us caring for us and loving us because you love us with an absolute love as you love every other single human being help us to reflect that love as we deal with strangers friends neighbors or people who disagree with us This we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.
It was great to hear from Pastor Steve. We're so glad you're here again. You might want to share this with a friend if it was helpful today. You may want to give us a little review on the podcast. That helps people find where we are. Remember, we are in the midst of the God's House, Our Home, a campaign, a capital campaign over and above our regular giving. We're asking for gifts for the next two years over and above. As you heard in the past, Kathy and I have made our pledge. I'm going to drive my car a little longer so that I can make a bigger gift and I encourage you to say, God, what do you want to do through me? How could we make God's house someone else's home? Our, not just ours, but someone else's home for generations to come. Will you consider that, pray that, and then also respond? Thanks for your generosity.